Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening everyone and thank you for attending this presentation. First, I would like to thank the IUSSP and the Matei Dogan Foundation for this award. I'm very honored. I would like to thank also my colleagues who um, wrote the letter, who signed the letter and uh, who believed it was worth doing. And I would also like to thank uh, all the colleagues with who I worked over the last 20-25 years for these valuable collaborations. When I received the, the letter from the IUSSP telling me that I was going to receive this award, I was very pleased, I was also very surprised, I must say. And then I read the letter and I saw I was invited to, to give a speech on a topic of my choice and it took me a little while to decide uh, on what I was going to talk. And finally, uh, I decided to talk about male fertility around the world and over time with a subtitle on tapping untapped data for comparative fertility research. And so in this presentation, uh, I will present some of the work I did over the last few years uh, on this topic. And I will also make some advocacy for more research on male fertility with um, existing data. So the background for this presentation is the sharp contrast between knowledge on male fertility and on female fertility. And in many countries, and especially in developing countries, uh, even simple facts about male reproduction are not known. And well, data collection has focused to a large extent on female fertility, and this is part of the explanation for this lack of studies. And these methods were developed in the Western context uh, with um, the assumption, uh, maybe implicit assumption, that um, men and women had uh, similar interests and, and behavior. But this tends to ignore the specificities of male fertility. Um, and yet uh, data is uh, available and has been um, largely untapped, so maybe it's not as rich as we would like it to be, but it is available, even though we could, uh, we could do more, obviously. So this, uh, this lack of research on men's fertility has been highlighted in several papers, and I, uh, I uh, show the title of uh, some of them. Of course, this does not mean that uh, there has been no research on, on men's fertility. And in fact, there has been a lot of very interesting research. But maybe what is lacking is a broad picture or a big picture of uh, the patterns, the level and the determinants uh, around the world in a large number of countries, at least, and over time. So in this presentation, I will address a few questions and provide a, a few uh, descriptive results mainly, and I will try to make the case for more research on this topic. So the first question is simply, can we measure age-specific fertility rates and determinants with existing data uh, in, in, in the world and especially in the developing countries? Uh, and the second question, which is related to the first one, is what are the uh, levels and age patterns of male fertility around the world? And how different is it from female fertility and why? And the uh, next point is uh, about changes. Uh, how has male fertility changed over time? Have changes been similar to changes among women? Uh, and what can we expect in the future? Uh, for male fertility and what do trends in male fertility say about fertility transitions and should we use both male and female fertility trends to describe and to analyze fertility transitions. So um, part of uh, what I'm going to say was published in, in these two papers so uh, here are the titles if you want to know more about that. So the first question is about measuring male age-specific fertility rates. And, um, well, can we estimate these rates with existing data? In Western countries, uh, that kind of information is published, uh, including in the United Nations Demographic Eurobooks. It's not exhaustive, it's not always um, very detailed, but it's fairly widely available. 
in less developed countries or in the global south uh, we can use censuses and surveys um, DHS mix to estimate male age specific fertility rates with different methods and I will briefly show some results and finally it's also possible to use indirect approaches in some cases and I will uh, talk about it later so this is the kind of uh, data that is widely available in DHS mix or some censuses and uh, this is the household roster and on each line we have information on the members of the household and for each child age um, between 0 and 17 here we have information on the survival st status of the father and if the father lives in the household it's possible to uh, to link the, the, the child to uh, to his or her father and this makes it possible to obtain information on the father so there are some uh, difficulties in using these data for estimating, estimating male fertility but uh, it is possible to measure male age specific fertility rates with that kind of data and it is what is shown uh, on this graph for Ghana um, another uh, simple information available in some DHS surveys not in all um, is about the date of birth of the last child with that simple questions it, it's it's also possible to measure age specific uh, fertility rates as it was shown by Carl Schmertmann and I use that to um, to compute male age specific fertility rates in some uh, in, in some countries and um, it's not perfectly consistent with what we found with the own children method it's a little bit lower but uh, the broad pattern is quite similar and then there is a, a third uh, type of question on uh, the number of children ever born and if we have that information at two points in time in two surveys it's also possible to derive male age specific fertility rates uh, also based on, on a method uh, by um, developed by Carl Schmertmann, the crisscross method and I use that also in Ghana and this is the blue curve so we see that uh, these three curves do not perfectly match but they give basically the same pattern um, and what is clear from comparisons on a large number of countries is that the um, the, the own children method is really the most interesting because uh, it's widely available it covers the largest age range and it provides the most plausible estimates usually and actually it's um, it's useful to estimate uh, age uh, pattern by five-year age groups but it's also possible in fact to uh, to measure age patterns by single ages and to um, reconstruct fertility trends by pooling several surveys as it is shown here uh, for Senegal and I will come back to this later so the uh, own children method is really very useful in this context uh, the method based on the date of last birth is uh, also quite interesting uh, for the determinants of uh, fertility and for instance it's possible to compute male fertility rates by level of education as in Niger where there is uh, almost uh, three children difference between the uh, less educated men and the more educated men or by uh, uh, activity status whether people work or not as it is shown in Bolivia and where we see that uh, non-working men have a much lower fertility and this is possible in a fairly large number of countries but not uh, in as many countries as with the own children method so um, I used um, the, the own children method with other data sources to um, to give a broad overview of levels and patterns of male fertility around the world and actually it's possible when we combine all the data sources to cover uh, 163 countries uh, all the countries in blue are um, the western countries uh, basically with um, data from civil registration uh, systems uh, all the green countries are covered by sur surveys and uh, some countries are covered by censuses 
or at least censuses provide information on male fertility. And what do we find? Well, that male fertility is uh, globally uh, much higher than female fertility, and this is especially the case in sub-Saharan Africa, where uh, male fertility can reach uh, uh, 13 or almost 14 children uh, per, per man, and it's especially high in Western Africa, where uh, polygyny is uh, frequent. We can um, compare male and female fertility, and this confirms that uh, in some contexts, and especially in countries where fertility is still fairly high, male and female fertility are quite different. And this is what is uh, shown here. We see for Senegal that uh, male fertility is much higher. Actually, it's almost twice as high as female fertility. And it's also uh, much later. Men have their children on average 15 years uh, later than, uh, than women. In Haiti, uh, the situation is uh, a little bit different. It's intermediate between uh, what we find in Senegal and in uh, Western countries, as in France, which is uh, on this graph, where there is a, a, a difference in the age at which men and women have their children, but the, the overall fertility level is fairly uh, similar. So the reproductive experiences of men and women in many countries are very uh, different. This is uh, what this, uh, this shows. And uh, we can compare the total fertility rate for men and women in all these countries. And this confirms that in many countries, men's fertility is much higher than women's fertility, and uh, sometimes twice as high, as I, as I said. Uh, and actually, in the, the Western countries, uh, the, the levels are quite similar. But uh, this is not uh, what we find in the majority of countries, actually. And these differences are, to a large extent, uh, related to the differences at which men and women have their children, and the differences in numbers of men and women at these ages. So, said briefly, in young populations with a, a rapid population growth, uh, men will be uh, much less uh, numerous than women at ages at which they have their children, and this will influence the fertility rates and explain the large uh, uh, differences between men and women. And another question we can look at with these data is uh, how has male fertility changed over time, and how can we expect it to change in, in the future, and how different are these trends from uh, trends among uh, women. And as I said with the, the own children method, it's possible to reconstruct trends in male fertility for about 40 or 50 years in many countries. And uh, this is what these figures show. Um, in, in Senegal, actually, it has uh, changed, but not that much. It's, um, it used to be uh, between 12 and 14 uh, children in the 1980s. It's currently around 10 children. And the difference between men and women has uh, remained fairly uh, large. In uh, Ghana, in contrast, men's fertility has decreased uh, quite fast, uh, much faster than women's fertility. And this points to the fact that uh, it may be interesting, it may be useful, to uh, use both men's fertility and women's fertility to describe fertility transitions. In Cambodia, uh, it has also decreased quite uh, fast uh, among men. And I also show results for uh, Denmark uh, uh, coming from uh, the, the data by uh, Dudel and Klusner. And uh, here we see that uh, differences are very small and actually uh, in Western countries, it's usually a little bit higher among women than among men. And in the future, uh, what can we expect? And uh, this is uh, where indirect approaches uh, come. It is um, quite easy, actually, to estimate total male fertility rates if uh, the number of births has been projected 
for instance using uh, female age-specific fertility rates. So here I use the projections by the, um, the United Nations Population Division. We have the number of births in the future, we have the uh, number of men by age in the future, and with um, an assumption on the age pattern of male fertility, it is possible to estimate the total fertility rate for men. I did that for a few countries and we see for instance for Senegal again that um, men's fertility is much higher than women's fertility as already discussed and it will remain so probably, most probably, uh, for, um, for several decades in around 80 years, so by the end of the century, uh, male and female fertility should be uh, similar, but uh, it will take uh, quite uh, some time before they converge. So uh, I've briefly presented some results, um, and to conclude I would like to mention that existing data offer lots of opportunities uh, to improve our knowledge of male fertility in a large number of countries, so to document levels, patterns, trends, uh, determinants of men's fertility, uh, differences in men's and women's fertility uh, transitions, for instance, uh, what does a faster male fertility transition indicate? Uh, it's possible to, to look also at questions that have been addressed uh, in some countries, but look at them in a larger set of countries, such as uh, differences in the effect of education, employment, economic crisis on male fertility and on women fertility. And I did not talk about uh, questions su such as entry into parenthood or fertility preferences, but um, uh, these surveys such as DHS uh, also provide very useful information on these topics. And finally, I would like to conclude by saying that sometimes uh, simple questions can make a, a big difference. And I think it is worth thinking of a few questions that we could add in existing surveys to better document male fertility. Thank you for your attention.